Yeah, the living word of God will be from Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1 through 4. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1 through 4. Now even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship in the earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle which is called the Holy of Holies, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant cover of all sides with gold, in, in which was a golden jar holding the manna, and Aaron's rod which bought it, and the tables of the covenant. This is the word of God. Amen. This time, uh, Reverend Abraham Andrew Pack will come out and deliver the sermon. All right. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Did you have a good lunch? Yes. I want to thank our Loimus Praise team. We are right now Loimus Light, you know, just three people today. But it was great. Thank you very much for that praise. So today, um, I want to just kind of continue because we started studying about the tabernacle. So I want to try to finish that as soon as possible because we have come into the new year and I would like to continue with something else. So I'm going to try to finish this as soon as possible. So today we're going to study about the location of the altar of incense. And then the uh, subtitle is called Power of Prayer. So we're talking about the altar of incense. Just to review, the tabernacle, remember, was what God had told Moses and the Israelites to build so that God could come and meet with them and he could speak with them and eventually he will dwell with them, right? So the tabernacle looked like this. This is the courtyard. It had the altar of burnt offering here, the laver here with water in it. And then we had the sanctuary here. It was divided into two like this. The first place was called a holy place. It had the golden lampstand here, a, bread, a table of the bread of presence with 12 loaves stacked up on top of each other like that. And then right here was the altar of incense. Okay, right here, right in front of the veil. And then there was a veil here and this place was called the Holy of Holies. And what was in here? The Ark of the Covenant, right? Like this. So this was the tabernacle. People entered here. They offered their burnt offerings here. The priests would wash their hands and feet here. They would go inside, burn incense. The high priest, one day out of the year, was able to go in here and make uh, offerings to atone for the sins of all of Israel, right? So today we're studying about this right here, the altar of incense. What is this? What does it mean? Why do we need to know this? We don't have this anymore. This is thousands of years ago. Why is this important? So today we read from Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through 4, right? Did you guys notice something wrong here? Did you really listen and read carefully as... The presiding pastor was reading. There's something wrong here in Hebrews chapter 9. What is wrong? Find the thing that's wrong. <laughs> Look at the picture here and what's wrong. It doesn't match the picture, right? If you look at verse 3, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 3 says, Behind the second veil, so this is the second veil right here. First veil, second veil. 
behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle which is called the Holy of Holies, right? This is the Holy of Holies. Having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant. So did you guys get that? What's wrong? What's wrong with this picture and what we just read in Hebrews chapter 9 verses 3 and 4? The golden altar of incense is not behind the second veil, but it's in front of it. It's over here. It's not in here. Right? Are you guys getting this? Are you with me? Can you nod or blink or do something? <laughs> so the altar of incense is in front of the veil, not behind it. It's in the holy place, not in the holy of holies. Okay? But Hebrews chapter 9 verses 3 and 4 clearly says it's behind the veil, it's inside the holy of holies. So if people don't believe in the Bible, what do they say? Oh, they say the Bible has errors. Even God makes mistakes, they say. But that's not a mistake here. In fact, this is trying to teach us something. Okay? So what is this trying to teach us? So what is the altar of incense? And why is there th this d discrepancy between the Old Testament and the New Testament? Okay? So that, that's what we're going to be studying about. Number one, so what's the altar of incense? Well, it's, as it says, it's an altar where you burn incense, right? So this is a small altar in front of the, the veil that separates the Holy of Holies from the holy place. Incense was burnt on this altar, right? It had a, a censer on it. Censer is like this thing that, has, that holds incense in it. And the smoke comes out of the holes, right? The smell, the aroma of the incense. And you could carry it. It's portable. Or you could just put it there, right? And only the priests were able to go in there and burn incense twice a day. They were supposed to burn incense twice a day. And that's recorded in Exodus chapter 30, verses 7 and 8. So in the morning, they do it once. In the evening, at twilight, they go in and burn incense. But the important thing is this. On the Day of Atonement, okay, on the Day of Atonement, which is the 10th day of the seventh month, which here in Long Island is called Yom Kippur, okay? Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. On Yom Kippur, the high priest takes the censer, puts a lot of incense in it, makes it burn a lot of incense, and he goes inside the Holy of Holies, only one day out of the year. And he has to carry the censer with incense in it. And the reason is, the Bible says in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 13, any human being goes in here and sees the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, they die. Okay, because we're all sinners. Because this was the presence of God, right? So even the high priest would die if he looked directly at it. So the Bible says, God commanded the high priest to burn a lot of incense, to make a cloud of incense, to cover the Ark of the Covenant so that the priest would not die. Okay? So Leviticus chapter 16, verse 13 says this, He shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the Ark of the Testimony. Otherwise, he will die. See? So the, the altar of incense is very important. It helps the high priest to go into the Holy of Holies and prevent him from dying. Okay? That was the, the role, the function of the incense, the altar of incense. So what is the meaning of all this? What does the altar of incense mean for us today? In the Bible, incense... You know, you guys all know what incense is, right? You burn it and smoke comes up. The smoke goes up, right? So when the ancient people saw that, they thought, oh, just like the smoke that goes up, we want our prayer to go up to heaven, to God, right? So incense in the Bible symbolizes prayer. 
Okay? Incense symbolizes prayer. That does, mean, that does not mean you have to burn incense for your prayer to go up. It, it, we're talking, you know, this is symbolic. It's spiritual meaning, okay? Our prayer is like incense to God. So they thought in the ancient times, God would smell the aroma of the incense and it would please him. And God would accept their offering and their prayers because of that sweet aroma. And just like that, we need our prayer to reach God and it must be pleasing to him so that he accepts our prayer and answers our prayer, right? That's what we want, right? So in the Bible, incense is symbolic of prayer. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. Okay? Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. So Revelation chapter 5, verse 8 says this. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. See? This is a description of heaven. The Lamb, Jesus is there sitting in the center on the throne. We have the four living creatures and the 24 elders. They all had a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So saints like you and I prayed and the, the prayer went up to heaven and it's now being delivered up to Jesus Christ. Right? Revelation chapter 8, verse 3 and 4 also says the same thing. Okay? So incense is symbolic of prayer. Now, the point of today's sermon is this. Why is there a discrepancy in the Old Testament, it clearly tells us that the altar of incense was here on this side of the veil, inside the holy place. But in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 9, it says the altar of incense is inside the holy of holies, behind the veil. Why this discrepancy? And what is the redemptive historical significance of this? And it is this, okay? What the writer of Hebrews is trying to tell us is that even though physically the altar of incense is here, functionally it belongs inside the Holy of Holies. Why? Because on the Day of Atonement, the high priest takes it inside, right? To make a cloud of incense so that it will prevent him from dying, right? So functionally, the altar of incense belongs to the Holy of Holies, but physically, it sits outside. Okay? That's what, it, that's what it's trying to teach us. So now then, redemptive historically for us, why is that important? It's trying to teach us that we as saints are truly precious beings because physically, even though we are here on earth, physically, you and I are here, right, on earth. Are you guys here? <laughs> Physically, spiritually, where are you? Physically, we are, here, we are here, but spiritually, our prayer could reach God. That's what it's trying to teach us. Okay? Even though physically we're living on earth, our prayer is powerful so that it could penetrate through the veil into the presence of God. That is the grace and the blessing that God has given to us. This is really a tremendous, tremendous blessing. And not only that, it teaches us that Jesus Christ, who is God himself, came into our domain, right? On earth, with flesh, and he interceded for us. Okay? Jesus Christ, who is God himself, so like, for example, metaphorically, Jesus would be here, but he came over here for us. And he prayed for us to God the Father. He interceded for us so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we could be saved. And not only that, now if we pray in Jesus' name, our prayer could do the same. Our prayer could cross over into the spiritual realm, into God's presence, and it could be answered. We could have a relationship with God. That's the power of prayer. Okay? 
That's what the altar of incense is trying to teach us. That is why in the Bible, there seems to be a discrepancy. But if you and I, we all believe that the Bible is the inerrant and infallible word of God, right? We have to believe that. If you don't believe that, you will misunderstand the Bible. So if you believe, if we believe that the Bible has no errors, and you discover these kinds of discrepancies, two things that contradict each other, then we think, oh, this must be something important. Because we're not going to think, this must be a mistake. There is no mistakes in the Bible. So this must be something important. God's trying to teach us something important here. And that's what the altar of incense, the location of the altar of incense is trying to teach us. So that's the power of prayer. We have been given this tremendous singular privilege to be able to talk to God. Imagine if you had a direct line to Donald Trump. You might not like that so much. <laughs> but you have a direct line to God, right? That's even better. But we're not using it. Why is that? We have this privilege of being able to cross over into God's presence, even though we're here on earth. But we're not using that. We need to be praying to God daily. In fact, as the Old Testament teaches, we need to be praying to God twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening, right? We need to have conversations with God all the time. I want to end by uh, talking, uh, giving you an illustration about something um, that happened recently. China recently, um, I think it was in 1977, created this thing, this um, department called the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And the Chinese government said, I want you guys to do this research, and this is what they wanted to find out. Because if you studied, you know, world history, China was once the greatest, most powerful country in the world, before 1500 AD. So the Chinese government said to these people here, find out what happened after 1500. Why did the West overtake us? So they went and did years of research. What do you think was their conclusion? You could probably guess, why would I say this? Right? What do you think was their conclusion? So this is what they said. At first, they thought it was because they had better gunpowder that the West overtook us. But that wasn't it. And then second, they thought it was because they have a better political system that they overtook us because democracy is better, right? But they said, no, that wasn't it. And then they thought maybe it's because they had a better, you know, economic system, free market economy. But that wasn't it either. So what the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences concluded was it's because of their religion. Christianity. That's why the West overtook China and became the most powerful nation in the world or people in the world. And more specifically, why do you think it happened at around this time? Well, our Catholic friends might not like this so much, but this is when the Protestant Reformation took place around this time. And one of the great innovations of the Reformation was that every person was able to receive their own Bible and read it on their own. Before that, they couldn't because the Bible was only in Latin. Only the educated people could read it. Regular people didn't know how to read Latin. So Martin Luther translated the Bible and gave it to everyone. And at about that time, the Gutenberg Press was invented so they could make copies of books really fast so they were able to have put the Bible in the hands of every human being 
And ultimately what that meant was each and every one of you could have a personal relationship with God one-on-one. You don't need anybody else. You don't need the pastor. You don't need the pope. You don't need the king. It's just you and God one-on-one. That's how special each and every one of you are. Because you are created in God's image. You are his children. That was a revolutionary idea. Today, we, everybody accepts that, right? But back then, that was revolutionary. That changed the world. That changed history. That turned everything upside down. And the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences came to the conclusion that that was when the West overtook China. So why am I telling you this? One of the great privileges that we have as individuals who are created in God's image is that we can pray to God, and He hears us, and He answers us. But if you're not using that privilege, maybe someday God may take that away from us. Okay? We need to pray to God. We need to talk to Him. Okay? Why are we not using this great privilege where our prayer could cross over into the Holy of Holies, into the pre presence of God, and have a relationship with Him. So now we have this immense privilege of being able to pray to a holy God in the name of Jesus and come into His presence without fearing punishment. Okay? So I hope and pray that all of you will use that privilege to have daily conversations with our Father, and that you may be able to strengthen the covenant bond that is between him and us individually. Each and every one of us, we have that bond. You want to strengthen it, right? You want to get to know him better. You want him to get to know, know you better, right? We want to have a stronger relationship with him. You know what's sad? This is the conclusion that they came up with. But now, America, Christianity is either plateauing or declining. Same with Korea. Why did Korea grow all of a sudden financially, become one of the wealthiest countries in the world? Because in the 60, from the 60s through the 80s, the Korean church went through a huge revival. But then from the 90s, started to plateau again. Now, even in Korea, the churches are declining. Where do you think Christianity is growing the fastest in the world right now? It's not that hard, right? Where? In China. So, I think their conclusion is right. It was Christianity that made America and the West become successful, made Korea also become successful. If you look at the countries around the world, all the countries that have accepted the gospel of Christ have done well. But now, after a long time, those countries, because they're wealthy, now they're rejecting Christ. They're turning away from the gospel. What do you think is going to happen in the next 50 years, 100 years? That cycle goes back and forth. China is the fastest growing Christianity in the world. Think about that. Okay? Faith in God is the most important thing in our lives. This is what makes us special. I hope that we will all use this great privilege of praying to God so that we could truly become the children of God and that through us, our church may grow, our family, our families may do well, and our nation, our country, United States, our country of Korea, China, wherever you may be from, if we pray to God for our country, our countries will do well too. So I hope that we will all become people of prayer. Amen? Let, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for teaching us about the power of prayer Father God, even though we have been given this immense privilege and power to be able to reach your ear, there are many times where we do not use this privilege. Father, please forgive us, and I pray that you will enable us to have this discipline of prayer in our lives daily. I pray that you will work within the hearts of the young people so they will start young and be able to pray to you daily so that they could strengthen their covenant bond and relationship with you, Lord. And I pray that our prayers may truly be delivered to your presence. May each and every person here and each and every family that is represented be able to receive answers to all of their prayers in the year 2019. And most importantly, we pray for the growth of our church, 
I pray that you will bring forth growth and revival at Evergreen Church in the year 2019. So all of the seats that are empty right now may be filled with your children whom you have predestined from before the ages. We thank you so much. We give you all the glory and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give God the glory with our applause.